I love when Jesus reframes and redefines words. If you are a disciple of Christ, you should be committed to the reframing and redefining. You don't know what you're gonna know in 10 years. You know now more than you knew in your teenage years. Can I get an amen? Maturity looks like giving God permission to always reframe and redefine. As you grow in God, your capacity to understand what He's saying also grows. That is the fruit of your life is beautiful understanding. God is good, huh? I have such a deep affection for you. What a beautiful time of worship. My heart is full, overflowing. Spent some beautiful time with the Lord this morning and I just, I feel his affection for you. I'm pretty tender. Is that okay? I'm not here to wow you. I'm not here to be profound. What I really want more than anything is just to to reflect back on the beautiful things that God is teaching me. We're so in, we're in desperate need right now of people that will walk with Jesus and live to tell the story and be willing to show the way, right? We don't need a lot of slick, shiny stuff. We need the real deep, the beautiful understanding that gets you through the 99% of your life that isn't this, even though this is so beautiful. The last time I was on this stage for worship school was in 2018 when we um, recorded Raise a Hallelujah. That was a while ago. That was three years ago. I took a, a break in 2019. I'm going to talk a little bit about but the last time I was, I was here is when we tracked Raise a Hallelujah. Isn't that crazy? Jackson was in the room on his dad's shoulders. It was such a profound morning. I thought it was going to come out of my body. You, you don't, we don't always get the miracle, but when we do, you better praise about it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and when we were up here, I didn't even know Jackson was going to be here. And uh, I looked out and he was sitting on his dad's shoulders and whew, I was like, whoa, the miracle's in the room. The enemy's gonna pay. I'm gonna sing as hard as I've ever sang in my entire life, you know? When we got back those tracks, uh, Ed Cash, he sent me a message. He singled out my voice and, and he sent it to me and, and the only caption was guttural. <laughs> That's literally what he said, guttural. And his sweet little... Nashville accent, I could hear it. Guttural, Mel, guttural. So I'm happy to be here. I'm, I'm happy to be with you. I, it, the last three years, had, there's been a lot. A lot's happened. A lot of really high highs and really low lows and a lot of tension. I love tension. When you mature in God and you realize what is born out of tension, you don't hate it quite so much. I love what's born out of the fire. 2020 was, whoa. Everyone say, whoa. That's all we need to say about it. But man, I, I love a good disorientation. Because you can't reorient until you disorient. Can we all agree that 2020 was a, a mighty disorientation? 
It was woe. Say it again. The kindness of God allows us to get disoriented so that he can reorient our interior. As you mature in God, it's very important that you understand that. Because you don't want to misinterpret a disorientation. Right? You want to be able to accurately understand what God is doing. At the beginning of 2020, when everything really hit, um, I was feeling a lot of anxiety with my chronic illness. We didn't know what was coming down the pipe. And we were actually on a, on a trip. We were in Hawaii at the Youth with a Mission base. And, and I was like, whoa, this is a lot. And the Lord's like, yeah, it is a lot, but I've given you a sound mind. I'm asking you to stay still in there. And I said, okay, Lord. And we got back and everything just started crumbling. We, you know, everything's getting canceled. Everything's crazy. And, and when I saw it with the Lord, and I'm like, Lord, what are, you, what are you doing? What are you asking of me right now in this season? He said, you will not hustle for significance. You will stop you will wait and you will listen. That was in May. Of course, we didn't know what was coming. And the, the only thing the Lord said to me over and over, you will not hustle for significance. You will stop, you will wait and you will listen. A lot of listening, huh? If you have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying, you will lean in. You won't talk a lot. <laughs> you won't make excuses. You will listen. 2020 was a lot of listening. It's still, we're still there. And 2019 really prepared me for that. I went into 2019. Um, taking my first sabbatical year. Don't you love the word sabbatical? It's such a weird word. And I was super pumped because I, I've lived with a chronic illness for 20 plus years and I was really tired. And I had all these dreams and all these words and it was, I'm like, okay, this is it. Like all these promises of healing and all this stuff. I'm like, okay, we're doing it. Like I'm taking a year off. I didn't travel, I didn't lead worship. And I, I just hunkered down. And about two months into the year, uh, I, I found out I had some compounding situations happening in my body. On top of the disease I already had, there was other things going on. And, and what, I, where I, what I thought we were doing wasn't what we were doing. You know, when you're like, we're going to the Caribbean and you get there and you're like, nope, this is Alaska. <laughs> didn't prepare for this, didn't pack the right clothes. What am I doing here, right? What I thought was gonna be the most beautiful year quickly turned into really like a medical leave. It turned into protocols and treatments and it, it was a lot. A lot, a lot, a lot. Say a lot. And I, I, but I'm so thankful that I'm a friend of Jesus. I love him so much. And I know that I know that I know that a lot is okay. I've learned over the last 20 years how to let disappointment pass through instead of just rebuking it, rebuking it. I've actually let it pass through my heart so that I can live an authentic, honest relationship with Jesus. When things get really tough, which they do, every single one of you has a story of tough, right? I know that I know that Jesus is gonna be there. He's, he's not leaving even though it's getting increasingly intense. 
in months turned in to more months of just treatments and it was just getting really, really tough. And it was uh, around May, I was barely getting off the couch and I felt enough energy. I'm out in, the, in my yard. We live in Sophia, North Carolina, which is in the foothills. Um, and I have a deep affection for hydrangeas. Uh, it's taken me about, oh, 15 years for them to thrive and be beautiful, but I'm very proud of them. And so I, I'm, I'm outside and I'm, uh, I'm, I'm going to water my garden. And I have this, this collapsible hose. It's like a hose that when it's, the water's turned on, it fills up. And when it's off, it like collapses. It's lighter weight for my arthritis and my sweet husband got it for me. So it's, it's wound up on the hose holder situation. And I, I turn on the water and I'm, I'm watering my hydrangeas. But there's only this really tiny stream of water coming out. And I'm just looking at there, looking at the, the hydrangeas, the water's just barely coming out. And I said, you know when you just say something, you're not even thinking? I just said out loud, I need more pressure. And immediately I, bam, Holy Spirit, when he's like, Hello. And he looks at me and he goes, you need more pressure. And I said, that's not funny. That's not what I meant and you know it. This is, when you're a friend of God, you speak honestly. That's exactly what I said. That's not funny. You know what I meant. And the Holy Spirit said again, no, you need more pressure. I said, Lord, that's really, it's actually not funny. I, I can't, I can't take any more pressure. No more pressure. And he said, third time, you need more pressure. And then I started crying. It's usually the third time, right? When the Lord's like, so I'm super serious. And I'm like, Lord, seriously, like I can't, I don't know that I could take more pressure. And he said, Melissa, unwind that hose. So I take the hose and I'm, I'm literally just walking through my yard. It's, I have a very big yard. And so I, I completely pull it completely out because it was clamped at the connection. So I pull it completely out. You know, it pops out. And what, what do you think happens? Water everywhere. Lots and lots and lots and lots of pressure. And the Holy Spirit said to me, so Melissa, where does the pressure come from? I said, the well, that's right. You need more pressure. I love when Jesus reframes and redefines words. If you are a disciple of Christ, you should be committed to the reframing and redefining. You don't know what you're gonna know in 10 years. You know now more than you knew in your teenage years. Can I get an amen? Maturity looks like giving God permission to always reframe and redefine. As you grow in God, your capacity to understand what he's saying also grows. That is the fruit of your life is beautiful understanding. I knew in that moment that God was reframing and redefining pressure for me. That's a really normal interaction with me and the Lord. I felt his comedy. I felt his joy. I felt his severity, his seriousness. Because when you, when you really know the Lord, you want him to come and bring a little feedback, right? 
The, the fruit of maturity is that you give God permission to discipline you. Parent God that you never grow out of your need for. And I knew in that moment, God is redefining something for me. This is beautiful. Okay. And my heart was open. I, I long that a generation would get to the point when Jesus comes to give feedback, to reframe, to give discipline, that we don't shrink back in shame. But we say only a loving father would bring discipline into my life. Only a loving God would speak clearly to me, right? So I'm in that moment and I'm like, okay, Lord, what, my heart is soft, my, I'm wide open. Whatever you wanna redefine and reframe, I'm here. A couple days later, I, I'm sitting with our second year school and it's really small, it's like 15 students. And we're, we're sitting there and I, I asked them, I'm like, let's define pressure. You know, and, and like, just like an instant heaviness fills the room. You know, like, okay. You know, we're just sitting in this little room. We're in the round couches. It's very casual. I'm like, got a whiteboard out. I'm like, let's define pressure. You know, and, and these are the words that come out. Anxiety. Performance. The fear of failure. False responsibility. You know, all, the words are coming out and it's getting boom heavy, Right? One student said, I, I'm behind. Another one said, I'm running out of time. That's what pressure feels like. I'm running out of time. Another one said, crushing expectations. That's what pressure feels like. I'm never gonna be enough. I'm never gonna get there. Another one said, there, there are no options. That's what pressure feels like. You should have known it. You should have done it better. You should have made a better choice. And, and you, right, you can feel it like, whoa, it's a lot of pressure. Like the whole room is like, hmm, exactly what it is right now. It's like, hmm, yeah. And you're all like, yes, amen. No, should I say amen? Should I not? Pressure does feel like I'm running out of time. Right? Anybody ever felt like that? Raise your hand. Be honest. It's a lot of pressure. And then one of the students, and these are like 20 to 30 year olds. One of the students says, well, well were, you, were you asking for us to define negative pressure or positive pressure? And I said, well, I didn't say. But out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth will speak. Oftentimes when someone asks a good question, whatever immediately comes up is what you believe to be true. Never be afraid of people asking you questions. It's a very illuminating thing to find out what's actually going on. You stop lying to yourself and you get honest, right? So I'm sitting there and I'm like, I didn't actually say positive or negative. I just said, let's define pressure. And they're all like, oh God, you know, this is terrible. I'm like, it's actually not because the Lord is revealing what's actually in your heart. Can you define positive pressure? And they were like, no. Okay, like what, well, what has good pressure? Airplanes, the human body, the printing press. Without pressure, you would never have words in a book on a page. And they just started rolling through stuff, musical instruments, fire extinguishers, the atmosphere, an oxygen tank, a well. I'm like, yeah, so pressure is actually not bad. Don't you love when like the spirit of revelation just drops in a room and you're like, oh God, this changes everything. That's what it felt like in that tiny little room. What is the fruit of pressure when it's submitted to the Lordship of Jesus in friendship with God, when you don't misinterpret and misunderstand what season you're in, you can adequately ask good questions to the Lord and understand what he's doing. What is the pressure? What is the fruit of pressure? Perseverance, 
Consistency. What about the pressure when, when it's so intense and something comes out of you that you didn't even know was in there? And without that pressure, it's never gonna come out. The Lord is redefining, reframing. It was so beautiful. And I'm like, God, what are you saying? I give in to the word of the moment in my life, in my heart. What are you saying? And he said, Melissa, where does the pressure come from? Again, and I said, the well, God, the well. He's like, what is the pressure system? And I'm just like, literally seeing it's like, what is the pressure system? Lord, I don't know. What keeps the pressure good so that what's in my life can come out? And this is what the Lord said to me, the fear of the Lord. And then I started looking at actually, how does a well work, right? We live in the middle of nowhere. So we have to dig a very, very deep well to get water. And a well at a house is, is very deep. And then it has this pressure system. And then there's a holding tank. So there's the well, the pressure system, the holding tank, and then you, when you turn on the faucet and water comes out. And that beautiful pressure system pulls water from the well fills up the holding tank and gives you water. And when the pressure is lower, it activates the well to fill it back up so that you always have water. There's a consistent regulating, calibrating of the appropriate amount of pressure. It's constantly regulating. What is constantly regulating the pressure in your life? It is the fear of the Lord. This beautiful pressure system. Don't you love when you say the fear of the Lord and it's like another heavy whammo, like, whoa. You're gonna talk about the fear of the Lord at worship school? You better believe it. Romans 5, 4 through 5, 3 through 5, even in times of trouble, we have a joyful confidence that our pressures, it's a passion translation, that our pressures will develop in us patient endurance. And that patient endurance will refine our character. Refine, reframe, refine. And that proven character leads us back to hope. And this hope is not a disappointing fantasy because we can now experience the endless love of God cascading into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Pressure, beautiful pressure that produces beautiful perseverance that refines your interior, your character, and it will lead you back to real hope the hope that is not a disappointing fantasy, the hope that is real, right? The hope that gets you out of bed in the morning when you're in the worst season of your life. The hope that I experienced in 2019 was unbelievable. It was unlike a hope I had ever experienced. Even though I was in one of the darkest years of my life, of our family, it was not a disappointing hope. Do you understand? Because what God was doing in that pressure system was profound. And he started speaking to me about the fear of the Lord. That beautiful fear of the Lord that has kept me and Jonathan for 21 years. We just celebrated our 21 year anniversary. The fear of the Lord that has kept us I want, to, I want to define the fear of the Lord because I think in church culture, church history, we've misinterpreted it. And when you see an angry, distant God 
and you use that angry, distant imagination you have of God and what he's really like to, to fuel the fear to do good, it will never last. The religious spirit has completely twisted and misinterpreted the stunning fear of the Lord. Brian Simmons, who wrote the Passion Translation says, the fear of the Lord actually means to live in complete awe and adoration of God. To live in complete awe and adoration of God. Another definition, awareness of God's presence, a deep reverence and sincere commitment to obey. Astonishment. My favorite definition that I found of the fear of the Lord is the assurance that God is watching. The assurance that God is watching. See, when you know, Peter, hi. When you know Jesus and you know what he's really like, you don't mind that he's watching. You don't mind a loving Jesus that walked the earth, that took on flesh and bone and suffered and was resurrected, you don't mind that Jesus watching you all the time. It's like the safest place you could possibly be is in the fear of the Lord. The safest place you can possibly live is in the center of the assurance that he is watching all the time. To get to that place, you have to be committed to the constant reframing and redefining of the nature of God. What is he really like? And you experience what he's really like in pressure, in desperation, in the longing. And you store up that pressure for moments like 2020 when the whole world is falling apart. Do you know who Jesus is? Do you know how to trust him? Do you know how to process sadness, pain, disappointment, anger, instead of just doing religious rhetoric? It's like, he's good, 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 he's good. When I get around people that have suffered and are still walking with Jesus and they say, he is good. It shoots through my body. And I'm like, I believe you. Because you found out his goodness in the fire. When you know who Jesus really is, you will not ever push him away from watching you. And I'm not talking about just big sin. I'm talking about when I know that Jesus is watching, it's a completely different way that I do marriage that I do parenting, that I do family, that I lead my staff at home, that I do conflict, that I do anger, because I do do anger, that I do sadness and just all of it. When I know that he's there, he's the friend that sticks closer than a brother. He is the beautiful father, mother, parent God. He is the spirit of the living God that has come to fill you to the fullness, the beautiful fear of the Lord. It's so important that you commit your life to knowing what he's really like. Every season of my life, I know a little bit more what he's really like. Every trial, every mountaintop, every valley, all the in-between, affirming and reaffirming. When my kids were little, we live on on a lot of property, about 50 acres. When my kids were little, we have a lake in the very back of the property and they would wanna go play in the field. It's like this big field and garden and then this lake. When they were little, they would say, mom, can we go play in the field? And I would say, yes, but what is your boundary line? And they would say, the garden. I'm like, that's right, why? is the garden your boundary line? Because the lake is beyond the garden, that's right. And why can't you go to the lake by yourself? Because it's not safe, that's right. Go have fun. 
every pretty much ever other day, every couple of days. Mom, can we go to the field and play? Yes. What, what is your boundary line? The garden. Why is the garden your boundary line? Because the lake. And why? Because the lake isn't safe without an adult. That's right. And I said it over and over until they were mature enough to trust my motive. I created beautiful boundary lines until they were mature enough to trust my heart. I was not withholding the lake from them. Hear me. If Cadence would have been like, mom, you're withholding the lake. I just want to swim. It's all I want to do. You're such a mean mom. You're withholding the lake from me. Be ridiculous. No, I took him to the lake myself. I wasn't withholding the lake from him. I was creating a beautiful boundary line until he was old enough to handle that place. Do you know what God is really like? I think so much of our life is about the Lord defining and redefining the motivation of his heart. Jesus came and what enraged him the most was the misrepresentation of the heart of the father. The way it separated and isolated people from the beautiful heart of the father. You wanna give yourself to that beautiful place where God is, is, is redefining things. He's pulling you into his nature. And he will do that in pressure, guys. When you learn to ask better questions, you will start growing. I rarely, when pressure or stuff happen, I rarely go to the enemy and rebuking the enemy. I just rarely go there. My first question is, Lord, what's going on? Graham Cook said to me and Jonathan in our early 20s, do not ask God why. This is when I was very, very, very sick. He said, do not ask God why. Ask him, Lord, what do you wanna be for me in this season that you could not be for me in any other season? You must learn, write this down. I must learn to ask better questions. Mature disciples ask questions. Your discipleship is formed by the questions you ask to the Lord, to people around you. It's so important that you mature into the freedom of asking questions. I love getting around young worship leaders that have a bajillion questions. If worship leaders and getting around young people, they don't have any questions, that's when I'm concerned. Because pride keeps you from asking good questions. When you wanna put off a front that you know what you're doing, but you deaf don't know what you're doing. I tell my students every year, learn how to ask good questions. They're like, I don't even know where to start. I'm like, just start. Ask questions that are full of vulnerability. Open your heart, be willing to be wrong. Be willing to say, I have no idea what I'm doing. Be willing to ask the Lord powerful, beautiful questions. When I look back on the last 20 plus years of my life, absolutely the biggest pressure system has been my illness. And I can, I can look back and I can see the hand of God from, from when I was 17 diagnosed to 18 getting radically healed, healed to meeting Jonathan, getting married, getting sick again, it all coming back. I, I, I can literally, I could go through all of it and see the stunning hand of God. And this is what I realized. I realized in reflection in these last two years that, that me and Jonathan, we didn't accept the sickness. We embraced the pressure. I know that I will be healed on this side or that side. It's irrelevant to me. If you have a different theology than that, that's okay. When I look back on what's been formed in the fire of suffering and I see Jesus in the middle of the fire, 
And I'm like, I never would have known you like this unless I was in the fire. When that phrase came out of my mouth in these last two years, I fell to the ground and I began weeping. I've had so many people, don't accept the sickness, don't accept the sickness, don't accept the sickness. I'm like, I hear you. But you know what? I, I'm like, I, I'm, I'm here to make the enemy pay, no doubt. But I'm here to be a lover of God. We didn't accept the sickness, we embraced the pressure. And what the pressure formed in us is perseverance that redefined our character, that produced a hope that does not disappoint. What you feel from me right now is I am full of hope that does not disappoint. You understand? Full of it. I got a lot to give. The Lord told me this morning, you got abundance. Open up the hose, spray the people. <laughs> and you know what, the, what I, there's, I, could, I could, I have eight minutes left. I could talk for hours about the fruit of the pressure of the illness that I have. I know it's tweaking some of you, you're fine. I could literally talk for hours. I was thinking about me and oh, our, my marriage is amazing. My children, I'm a 19 year old and almost 16 year old. The community that we're leading, the songs. And I was talking to the Lord about just the fruit. I'm like, gosh, there's a lot of fruit. He's like, no, there's so much fruit. And the Lord said, let's talk about raise a hallelujah. Pressure. You know, me and Jonathan were able to write that song with Jackson and, the, and Janie and Joel in our hearts because of the pressure of 20 plus years of suffering. I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm. That wasn't a, a, just a light phrase. That's like lifeline. That's what gets me out of bed is to worship the Lord in the middle of pain. And the Lord said to me, he said, man, you were building up that pressure for a long time. I'm like, whoa, I, we were. And Jackson gets really sick and we're all like crushed, praying our guts out. You have no idea the yeses that you're saying right now, what kind of pressure you're building up for moments that are coming in your future. When we turned on the, the pressure, when we opened up the pressure system of what we've been walking through, and out came raise a hallelujah. It was a lot of pressure building up. Really good pressure. To be able to partner with our dear friends in such a traumatic time. We love to talk about the, the beauty of the, the miracle of Jackson, but the pressure system was crushing. What comes out of the crushing, the fragrance of the crushing? You want to learn to embrace pressure in your life, to yield to Jesus. We got a, we got a testimony last year of a little boy on our coast, North Carolina coast, that was swimming, a 12 year old boy that was swimming on the ocean. His parents couldn't see him and he started floating. He, had, he was dead, he drowned. They pulled his body in, he was purple. <laughs> and two nurses were on the beach. They came over and started doing CPR. A minute, two minute, three minute, no pulse. And his little sister started singing, I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder. And his mom's like, sing louder. All the little cousins get around. I'm gonna, they heard it on Caleb. They weren't at, they weren't at Bethel. Okay, these are like precious, just this precious family from Eastern North Carolina. And the kids, I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm, pressure. That pre that's what was coming out of them right now was 20 years of embracing pressure. I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm, little kids sing and boom, heartbeat. Heartbeat, 
Heartbeat. Heart, heartbeat, people. A little 12-year-old boy that was dead came back to life. You have no idea what your yes to Jesus right now, what's coming. Don't reach for the songs that change the world. Reach for Jesus. It's not about you writing a great song. It's about you being a friend of Jesus. It's about you embracing the pressure. It's about you living in the astonishing fear of the Lord where every choice you make, you wanna know how to be an amazing worship leader? Be an amazing friend. Be an amazing daughter, son, sibling, brother, sister, husband, wife. Be an amazing boss. And all that beautiful, what you're storing up in your heart, it will come out here. But when you try to turn it on and there's no pressure, We want the glory without the suffering. It's just not how it works. The glory, the glory, the glory that Jesus resurrected with because it's because of the suffering, you understand? It's the fellowship of his sufferings. You want to be a friend of God, don't you? You want to be able to hear him clearly. And when you need to rebuke the enemy, rebuke the enemy. But sometimes it's Jesus that's put you in the fire because he wants to reveal himself to you in a way that you could, not, you could not even comprehend. You don't know that he's the God that shows up in the fire until you're in it. We sang a lot of songs over the last 10 years of the worship movement and then 2020 hit. And the question is, do we know how to live the songs? I returned back to so many. Oh, we were like preparing our heart for this crazy pressure system. What is God forming in you right now? What's he been forming in you? I actually believe that the Lord wants to really give honor to some of you who are older, who have walked with the Lord a long time. And you thought those seasons were for nothing because maybe they didn't end here. But they're everything. The pressure is everything. And you wanna be able to be such a beautiful friend of the Lord that you yield you want to yield to his beauty. You want to yield to his path. Do you understand what I'm saying? He's so beautiful. Let's open our hands to the Lord. God, we're asking that you would reframe and redefine pressure right now. So a lot of moments that have happened in the last year, two years, three years, five years that we don't understand. But I'm asking that you would show yourself mighty, show yourself in those moments. God, we're asking that you would help us understand, that you would help us understand your heart what you were doing. In Psalm 111.10, it says, where can wisdom be found? It is born in the fear of the Lord. Everyone who follows his ways will never lack living understanding. And the adoration of God will abide throughout eternity. God, we're asking for living understanding. Every life in here, every single story represented is beautiful and it's a fragrant offering unto the Lord. God, I ask right now for those in here that have felt lost, that you would validate their story, that you would validate their process. 
We ask God, put your hand on your head. We ask God that you would touch our minds, that you would give us living understanding. We want to walk in the assurance that you are watching. We want our life to be a fragrant offering. Teach us, God, to embrace the pressure that we would be able to understand you in a more profound way than we ever thought possible. Heal our minds. Every place where the religious spirit has distorted the fear of the Lord, we give to you, God, and we ask that you would heal our minds. We want to understand what it is like to adore you, to live a life unto adoration. We thank you, God. And I thank you, God, for the songs that are being born in the fire. We want to be worshipers that carry your presence and your nature. And we give you our ego and our desire to be seen and heard. We want to walk with you. That you would be seen and heard. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.